Hello, BroadwayCon. This is Erin Quill, Fairy Princess, and I am bringing to you, it's, it's actually a very exciting part of the advocacy that BroadwayCon is very interested in doing. We have an interview here today with Jeffrey Omora, who is running for District 6 of the New York City Council, that is the Upper West Side. As he is even talking to us, people are balloting and, and campaigning and it's all going on. It's very exciting. And if elected, he will be the first openly gay candidate in his area in District 6. And he will be the first ever Japanese American to hold office in New York City or New York State? New York State. That's like, oh, that's outrageous. That's outrageous. All right. So Jeffrey, you are an actor, yes? That's right. Yes, you went to Carnegie Mellon. As did you. As did I, right, it's true. Although I might, went much later, before you. Mm -mm. No, um, no, it's all right. <laughs> and um, you, so, so how, so explain to me the transition between being an actor and then deciding to get further into politics and run for city council. Yeah, it's kind of a, kind of a long story, but uh, you know, I've been here- in time. <laughs> I've been here in New York City for 15 years. Um, I got my start right here in the on the Upper West Side doing Shakespeare in the Park with production of Romeo and Julia. That's how I fell in love with the neighborhood. Uh, and you know, I was I was pretty happy doing doing my acting thing. Um, and uh, several years ago, I was I was working off Broadway, just barely scraping by on a union contract, not making enough money to live. Uh, nobody, and, nobody made any money. Nobody oh, on off Broadway makes anything at all. They don't even make their rent. It's a, it's a crime. That's it's a crime. Sad anyway. Um, so I got together with some colleagues who were all in the same situation. We were going broke while working full time, getting rave reviews in the New York Times, bringing in millions of dollars for the, the greatest theater companies in the country. And we couldn't afford to pay our rent. So we created this campaign called Fair Wage on Stage. And we organized the whole off-Broadway theater community. And that, that campaign gave our union leverage, gave Actors' Equity Association leverage at the negotiating table to demand some real wage increases. And that year we got record-breaking wage increases up to 83%. So I was hooked from that moment on uh, as, as a labor organizer. And I ran for a seat on Actors' Equity's National Council. And I've been on the inside ever since. Uh, fighting for, for greater wages and, and better working conditions and more job opportunities for our more than 50,000 members across the country. Things were going pretty well for us. Yes, they were. I voted for you. Thank you. We, we led uh, the union's first strike in over 50 years and got profit participation back into the Broadway show development agreement, which was huge. That is huge. Uh, and uh, this, this past year, you may have heard a pandemic came through and shut down our whole industry. Really? Did you hear that? <laughs> yeah. I wonder if uh, I missed that. Oh, right. And uh, everyone uh, has pretty much been unemployed for, for over a year now. And this past summer, we realized that help wasn't coming for us. We were getting left out of the conversation at every level of government. Uh, at the time, the U.S. Senate was negotiating the HEROES Act. And it looked like we had about a week to convince the US Senate that they needed to, to send the arts industry some, some relief. So we scrambled, we called up everyone we know in theater, music, dance, comedy, museums across the country, and we called them onto a Zoom. And we said, here's the situation. We all need to get on board. We all need to call up our, um, our our senators and we need to, you need to use your subscriber bases, those email lists to get all of your patrons to call you the senators too. That, that new campaign was called Be an Arts Hero. And our, our organizers ended up meeting with over 60 US Senate offices with a really simple economic message, which was, this is the number of jobs that are created in your state because of the arts. This is the exact economic impact of the arts in your state. And suddenly, uh, you know, senators from Arkansas and Alaska and Texas are like, oh, wow, that's, yeah, the arts, I guess, aren't, aren't just this fun thing that we'll get to if we have extra time and money. They're an essential part of our economies. Uh, and sure enough, we, Mitch McConnell bought us a little time because he kept delaying that vote. 
But oh, he's December, so good at delaying. He's so good to us, isn't he? So in December, when it was finally voted Can't on, even look at you. Yes, okay, go ahead. We got $15 billion in direct arts relief through the Save Our Stages program that was sponsored by Senator Amy Klobuchar. We will always be grateful to her for that. Here in New York City, the situation is a little different where the arts make up an even greater portion of our economy than anywhere else in the country. We are the global capital of arts and culture. I gotten to know the arts advocates that we have on the New York City Council because after that Fair Wage on Stage campaign, I started to lobby the City Council for arts funding on behalf of those same theater companies to get them more money so that they could afford to pay us more. So I, I, I had relationships already with the arts advocates on the City Council. We have some great ones. The problem is they're all term limited. And right. after this election, there may be no one left on the New York City Council to advocate for the arts at a time when we need it most. We're going to need, listen, Broadway's gonna come back which everybody here, they're watching on BroadwayCon, on the website. So, I mean, that is the overwhelming question, right? Everybody's been writing in and calling in and saying like, when is Broadway gonna reopen? And what did we bring you? We brought you a guy with the answers. Jeffrey, go ahead, tell them when it's gonna happen. So Broadway will start to reopen this fall. We, we know that much, but we don't know how long it's going to take to build back to the record-breaking box office numbers that we saw in 2019. It's going to take time and it's gonna take a lot of support from within the New York City Council. So my goal in running for, for City Council here on the Upper West Side is to make sure we have at least one arts advocate at the table. And my goal is to chair the Cultural Affairs Committee. And that's the committee that allocates New York City's arts budget. In 2019, that was $212 million. It goes to support all of our not-for-profit off-Broadway theater companies, music, dance, museums, libraries. Uh, and that arts budget is larger than the national endowment of the arts budget. So it's, it's a big responsibility, um, but I, I strongly believe we need someone who knows the arts, who lives and breathes arts allocating that budget. Uh, with the goal to, to eventually grow it and to make it a lot more equitable than it's been in the past. So we can bring in communities that have been historically shut out of funding opportunities uh, because you know, there are a lot of people living in this city who have no access to the arts, who can't afford to see your Broadway show, who can't afford dance lessons and music lessons. And uh, we need to bring them into the conversation. It's one of the ways that the arts is most impactful is when it affects our youth. You know, there's a tremendous benefits that have been lauded almost since the beginning of time on what's studying the arts, what's studying music, what's studying dance, what's studying painting does to a person's confidence level, what it does to their ability to think outside the box, how it shapes young minds to be more open and more inclusive. And by, curtailing the arts purely based on financial ability, we are creating a cycle that continually rewards the upper tier of American society and leaves out the, you know, the economically disadvantaged. I mean, you're Asian American, I'm Asian American, New York City is 15% Asian American, yes? That's right. Yes, and how many of those are living below the poverty line. One in four Asian Americans in New York lives in poverty. Right, so think about that. One in four Asian Americans lives in poverty. They have no ability to like go and see a film. They have no ability to like get tickets at a festival or go to a Broadway show. A Broadway show is, is a, a completely different world right. to That's them. Right. And what we wanna do is make it equitable. It doesn't mean that we're giving out, you know, lessons all the time or whatever, but what it does is we give people opportunity and we fund arts to go down to where they are and in hopes that they will get inspired and come up to where we are. That's right. And, you know, there are so many arguments for why we need to prioritize the revitalization of arts and culture. And, I've, you know, I've already shared a little bit of the economic message. Um, you know, in, in 2019, 65 million tourists visited New York City, and they come here 
for the arts and culture. They come to see a show. And when they're here, they stay at our hotels and they shop at our retail stores and they eat at our restaurants, creating countless jobs in many different industries. So New York's future, New York's economic future depends on the revitalization of arts and culture. So there's the economic message. But then as we're coming out of this pandemic, we are going to need art. We are, we are literally the ones who survived and now we've got to live. And it's art and culture that reminds us what it is to be human. Sitting in a theater or going to a museum and, and having that shared collective experience of, of, of experiencing that art uh, is a profound experience. It, it's what connects us to each other. Um, it's what creates a sense of, of community um, that I think we've been so desperately lacking over the last year during this pandemic. Well, did you know that when um, an audience, after about like 10, 15 minutes, they found that an audience viewing the same production, their heartbeats synchronize. And that I think is a profound human truth that a lot of people ignore when they say, well, I'm just gonna go see a show and you know, they get all flustered and they do. And, and it's like a collective, when those lights go out and the, you know, when the audience lights go out and the curtain comes up and, and, the, and the spotlight hits whoever the lead is and the play is gonna begin, it's like everybody in the room takes a deep breath and goes, whatever happened outside, you get to forget it for a little while. I mean, we have to remember that this pandemic has, has not just affected artists as like artists, as performing artists and stuff, but it has affected them, their family lives, their childcare, everything. They really are struggling. Yeah. Uh, to, and, and, yet, and yet they are continually uh, volunteering to do like Zoom performances and volunteering to raise money for the actors. Like there is no group that I can point to with any other accuracy where, where I am, absolutely sure if I say this is a fundraiser for it doesn't even matter what it's for everybody I ask will say yes because that's what the artists do right and it's not just the actors that we're talking about no. right? work at stage managers directors writers stage hands technicians the box office and ushers and uh, Front of house I mean the whole administrative staff everyone everyone has been struggling for the last 14 months now and we, uh, you know, we've got more than 100,000 arts workers in New York City, and two thirds of them, at least two thirds of them have been unemployed for the last year. So it's time to get back to work. And I'm so excited because Broadway's coming back in the fall, but it's looking like Off-Broadway might be back this summer. Shakespeare okay. in the Park is already okay. in callbacks right now. So that, that's a go, we're gonna, we're gonna be seeing Shakespeare in the Park this summer. Um, I think many off-Broadway theater companies will be reopening and theaters across the country are starting to come back to life. We have a lot to look forward to. There's a lot to look forward to and there's a lot to be hopeful for. And it is great that you get a chance to talk to the Broadway Con audience because they are the ones that most importantly buy tickets. Uh, they buy tickets to everything um, because they love it so much. But also these are the people that not only love it, but they will stick with it. They'll stick with you. If you have a Broadway Con fan in your life, they will follow you from production to production. They know everything about you. They'll probably make clothes that look similar to your costumes. Like they're really, the first year I was there, I was like, wow, this is like, really, this is nuts. Well. Wow. Um, well, they they, uh, they might have some great opportunities if they want to come up to the Upper West Side. We're knocking on doors uh, every weekend. We are calling voters in the district every week. We uh, I keep saying we're going to win this campaign one conversation at a time. And we're going to talk to more voters than any other candidate in this race. We need a lot of help to do that. So if if what what we're talking about resonates with you, um, I, I'd love if you would go to the website, jeffreyomura.com and sign up to volunteer. Um, you'll be in, in, very good, uh, in very good company. We've, um, the Broadway community has rallied behind this campaign. Uh, just last week, Philippa Sue from Hamilton and Kara Lindsay uh, from, from Wicked and Newsies hosted a, a volunteer fundraiser for me. We've been endorsed by Gavin Creel and- um, Judith Ivey, wasn't it? Uh, uh, oh, Dana Ivy. Dana and, Ivy. Oh, and Judy Kuhn. Yeah. <laughs> I flipped them. It's okay. I'm sorry. I, I apologize, ladies. Yeah. Right. Reed Bernie. 
Um, so many, so many other great Broadway names um, have, have rallied behind this campaign. Um, Celia Keenan Bolger, uh, who so many so many other people that I'm forgetting. I know it's actually overwhelming, and I think one of the things that is so kind of heartfelt about your campaign is you are one of us. You know, you're an actor. You're a New York City actor. And you decided to seek out change. You know, you you want to be the change you want to see. So that is why the Broadway community is rallying behind you because you are one of us. And, you know, and you're not selfish. Like you're really giving your time and advocacy in a genuine way. And it started like as much as this campaign is like, you know, very polished. It started in an organic grassroots way. You were an actor struggling to pay rent. And then look where it's taking you. You know, yeah. that's one of the really amazing things about this campaign is how organically it's grown and how much you have learned and grown along with it to the point oh, where yeah. you can be the head of the budget for this, <laughs> for the, the head of the arts <laughs> committee. Absolutely. I would completely understand and, and support that. So now, when is the election? The election is June 22nd. Okay, so we and have time. We, we have time, we have a little bit of time. Voter turnout for these elections, you know, it's a democratic primary right. and voter turnout tends to be so low. So if you vote, it makes a huge difference. If you ask five friends to vote, it's, it's game changing uh, because it just grows exponentially. Um, and if you, if you sign up to volunteer and you call a whole bunch of uh, voters for us, Wow, that makes a, a huge, huge difference. Absolutely. So we want to encourage all of BroadwayCon, not just to listen to this message and be like, oh, Broadway's coming back. Yay. We want you to call two friends and so on and so on and so on so that they can get inspired to go to the polls and we can get somebody, not somebody, one specific person, Jeffrey Amora, into the city council because the city council is where New York gets run. New York City is run by the city council. As much as like the mayor says what he says and the governor says what he says, local government makes change. That's They're right. the ones who makes the rules. They're the ones that make it happen. And with, with this election, we have a huge opportunity because I'm, I'm not the only one on the ballot. Um, there are city council races um, and borough president, comptroller, district attorney, and the mayor, they're all on the ballot June 22nd. And when I, when I set out um, with this campaign, I, I knew that even if I'm elected, I won't be able to accomplish everything by myself. We're going to need broad, uh, a broad coalition of support. So we need every candidate running for office prioritizing arts and culture, which is why I released uh, a pledge asking all the other candidates to sign on to this pledge saying that they will also prioritize arts and culture. So far, more than 90 candidates across the country have signed on to the pledge, um, including some of the mayoral candidates, but we want all of them on the record stating that they will prioritize the revitalization of arts and culture. And so we need you, as your, um, the audience, as you're engaging with candidates across the city, ask them, what is your plan for arts and culture? And have you signed Jeffrey Romero's Arts and Culture Pledge? It's really important to advocate, advocate, advocate. It is so groundbreaking, this movement, because Broadway was uh, had the rug pulled out from under it, as, as did most of the arts and culture businesses. They completely took it on the chin and have been knocked out for at least a year. And what we wanna do is we want them to come back and be stronger, more vital, more inclusive, more representative of the general population and really change the way businesses run. We don't want it to come back business as usual. You know, we've seen the stories and business as usual is a little bit scary. Uh, so we, what we wanna do is we wanna bring back a new variant, sorry, COVID, a new <laughs> variant <laughs> on, um, on arts and culture. And, and I, think it's, I think it's really exciting. I think your campaign is hugely exciting. It's, it means a lot to me and it means a lot to my friends who, who know you, you know, who know you that they, they're like, oh, Jeffrey's running, did you hear? Like that was the, almost the first phone call prior to like you, you dropped the announcement and then I, my phone started ringing. So, 
you know, it's it's like really exciting. I really hope that Broadway Con audiences take this moment to in, get themselves informed, reach out to friends who are eligible voters, right? And make sure and encourage them to go to the polls. And where can they get like merch and stuff like that? Where's the, is it jeffyamora.com? Oh, uh, well, they'll have to come to my apartment to get the merch. <laughs> It's not, we're not, there's no merch for sale yet. Oh. We're, we're thinking about t-shirts. Um, we have an amazing design team. And do I have? Oh, you have I buttons have though, right? Buttons around right yeah, now. you have buttons. Um, yeah, we have buttons. We, have, we got lots of buttons. Um, See, you gotta uh, get. Up a West Side, I'll give you a button. Exactly. I saw somebody asked you for a button on Twitter and you were, and they were afraid to stop you at the gym. And you were like, dude, I always have buttons. Like I've stop me at the gym. Buttons, please. Please, I got buttons. I got the, you know, I mean, you could do my fair, uh, what is that? Me and my gal. You have so many buttons, you know? <laughs> Me so, my, or um, uh, office space. Yes. It, it pieces got, of flair. Of flair. Yeah. Yes, we all need Jeffrey Amora pieces of flair. So I want every, I encourage everyone to get their flair, wear it proudly. And walk around the Upper West Side a lot because people need, studies have shown that people need to see something 13 times before it makes an impact. So if you live on the Upper West Side and you're wearing your Jeffrey O'Mora swag and you walk past the same people every day, a couple of times is all it takes for them to go like, I wonder who that guy is. I should probably go to the website. If you want swag, reach out to me. I will get you swag. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Jeffrey, for visiting with us. And I'm really encouraged by your candidacy. I cannot tell you how much it means to me personally. And I wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me on here. And I hope everyone enjoys uh, Broadway Con. And, and um, I hope next year we'll be back in person. Next year, we definitely will be back in person. And next year, I'd love to invite Councilman Jeffrey Omora to join me at a on a panel or something where we talk about how arts revitalization in New York City is going. It would be my pleasure. I, I'm going to hold you to it. All right. <laughs> We're going to let Jeffrey go because he has way more people to talk to this evening. It was hard to schedule in these, these precious moments, but we want to thank him and we want to thank everybody who is sticking with Broadway Con during this pandemic, during this very different kind of live streaming convention. But next year, along with the arts community, we will be back in person. I'm Erin Quill. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>